100 dice. Welcome to the Stateless Code video. This is video number nine in our series, nerddice.com, where we create a Ruby on Rails application to provide for a role-playing, uh, tabletop role-playing management and things like that. So in this video, I don't think we're going to actually commit any code. I think it's a good, I had a retrospective action to, in the case of when you've got uh, multiple topics to, instead of including them all in one video to break them into smaller videos. So this is going to be an over video, over, overview video of the, the next several videos and what we're going to be doing here. So the, we're going to start with kind of, the, this is a, a fairly large body of work. So I've kind of got it organized as one issue here as an epic. And then in our um, on our board here, these items here are kind of subtasks on the larger uh, the, the larger issue here. So we're going to kind of tackle these things. We'll check out an epic branch, and then as we make our commits, we'll merge those features into the epic branch, and then when we're done, we'll merge the epic branch into our main branch. And this might seem a little artificial now because we don't have the app in production. There aren't really any other contributors on the project or anything like that, but it's a good habit to get into in the event that you get something like a depend a bot. Uh, I can never say that word. Depend a bot alert on something in your gemfile.lock or something like that as you're working on a feature. It's good to have that ability to check back out your main branch, upgrade to your uh, dependencies to make sure that you're not um, in some sort of a vulnerability situation and then check back out to your to your epic. So that's what we're uh, doing here, even though it, it seems a little bit artificial. Uh, and we want to try to think about this as a user story. So we've got a um, our story here as a user, I want to be able to sign up for account and securely authenticate so that I can secure and personalize my content in interaction with the site. And I guess the, the first question to ask is, as a user, do I really want to sign up for an account? Do I really want to do this sort of thing? And as a, a web user myself, I'm kind of 50, 50 on that. So there's a, Oh, a little bit of, unless you've got a reason for me to sign up for an account, I'm going to be hesitant to, um, to do so. Um, so, but it's as of right now, I think the, the safest way to any sort of customization or things that are specific to your account that you want to be able to keep specific to your account and not show to other people and stuff like that. It's kind of a necessary evil in this case. And um, evaluating the alternatives here, so I'm going to go over to um, the Ruby Toolbox, which is a, a great, let me open the home page here in another tab, a, a great kind of um, curation of what is available on Ruby Gems in the Ruby ecosystem here. So as you can see, the uh, the gem devise is the, the the clear leader in terms of the ecosystem uh, for web authentication for uh, Ruby. So there, that kind of by default, you when you're when you're dealing with a Ruby gem. When I first started doing Ruby on Rails, I went a little bit overboard in the, there's a gem for that. So everything I'm going to do, I'm going to just find the gem rather than doing anything myself. And what I found over time is that uh, when you add a gem to your application, if it become, if it's something that's critical for your application, then you are dependent upon that gem to continue updating and not becoming abandoned where, or you are kind of becoming willing to, in the event that this 
gem becomes abandoned that you'll need to find something new or fork the gem and publish your own kind of personal version of it that you continue to maintain. So uh, you always have to do the cost benefit analysis. Is there, uh, is it more beneficial to use what's already been built or do you roll your own? And obviously Rails itself is a gem. So I would, if I wanted to, um, to personally write my whole framework here for Rails, I would never get anything done in terms of my web application. I wouldn't do any feature work because I'd be spending the whole time trying to reinvent the wheel. And um, in this case, I could, and th there might, it's closer now to being something that I might consider doing than it was a year ago, um, roll my own authentication. Uh, it, and it's just one of those things, cost benefit, what, what's the opportunity cost of doing that? So um, it's not without risks. And we'll sh see in a second here that there are currently risks with using Devise in 2022 with a Rails 7 application. And we've got to kind of um, deal with that as we incorporate it into this application. So uh, rubygems.org, you can go here, search for a gem, we'll type device here, and we see that there's uh, significant download activity over the, the life of the gem and um, 10 million for the current version. So whenever you're looking at the a gem that you're going to use, one of the things you want to see is how often it's uh, it's maintained and there might be a good reason like if we go and look at our nerd dice gem that we created in our other series here um, you can see that it was released it's it's 0 0.4.0 .0 version less recently than devise did uh, but I'm as the maintainer I'm fairly confident that it's up to date and maintained the um, something like Devise, I would want to see um, something more recent than December of 2021 on this. And if you go into the repo itself, you can see as of right now, this is October 15th, 2022. Uh, the most recent commit to the main branch or merge into the main branch uh, was on June 27th, 2022. So there are a lot of open issues, a lot of open pull requests, and none of them as of right now have been uh, merged. So that, that it should uh, be a consideration when you're looking at it and evaluating a gem. And I'm going into this, this is a risk that um, there, there's a possibility that what, what if device stays paralyzed and um, essentially becomes abandoned where uh, do you have to, you'll have to pivot to something else in the ecosystem or main kind of maintain your own version of it or um, kind of back out and roll your own off. And then you'll have like everything that we will have done here will have been sunk cost. Uh, as of right now, I'm still leaning toward this being the, least bad option for our use case. So that's what we're going to do. I think that it will give us uh, working authentication with the least amount of effort um, and kind of the most benefit back um, with the caveat that we'll have to do a little bit of customization in order to get it to work with Turbo. And then we'll have to undo that uh, hopefully when the a new version Come, is released that um, works with Rails 7 without needing to kind of be um, patched in order to do so. So that is the kind of the overview of why we're choosing this solution uh, and so somewhat less confidently than I would have a year ago. Um, and I added these things as notes. Uh, I'm also in this epic Usually by default Rails, your um, database primary key is a big integer ID, which for most cases is fine. Uh, you're not really putting much in jeopardy by doing that. But um, for something tightly coupled to your um, user design and authentication, 
um, sequential integers is, is um, a little um, a little less um, safe. And that, that that's not there are a bunch of redundant mechanisms um, needed in order to compromise a user ID, even if you know that like I'm user slash eight and there's a user slash seven and a user slash nine, you've got to like compromise the rail secret and secret key and um, the, potentially your device salt and your device pepper. Like there, there are a bunch of different uh, levels of um, defense here that would all need to be compromised in order for this to happen. But um, it's not that big of a lift to uh, make the um, primary key in this table a UUID rather than a big in integer. So we're going to go with that. Um, and noted here, uh, device doesn't work out of the box with uh, rel seven and turbo yet. So we're going to have to, um, to deal with that. And because of this logging in and logging out, if that breaks, your whole app is broken. So if ever you were in a situation where you might do something that is considered over testing and redundant, your login and log out of your app would be the place to invest that effort. So um, you want to make sure that the, the JavaScript browser interaction and everything works. If the app is responding to a, a turbo stream, you need to make sure that it's um, rendering that correctly in the video in the, I'm sorry, in the, uh, the visual of the browser and that you're not kind of having a situation where something might work in a, uh, request response test that you have, but is broken on your user level. So we'll be um, producing a variety of different ways to test this uh, so that in the event that something else comes up that breaks a, an existing device configuration, either a device version or a Rails version, we want to be alerted to that as quickly as possible. And we want to make sure that the the browser part of that is considered because you don't have a working application if you can't log in using a browser. So the steps we're gonna go through to do this in the next video, where you're just going to install Devise. It's hopefully going to be a fairly short video. We'll commit that unit of work as its own entity. And then in the subsequent video, we'll kind of do the customization of device to work with this particular web application. So uncomment or change the things in that device initializer file that gets generated, then um, choose the device modules that we want to, well, actually that, that'll be done in the generate user model video. So it's mostly kind of gem level configuration we'll do in the video after that. Then we'll uh, add that UUID support to Postgres and generate a user model. And that, that I think, even though they're so related that I, those will probably be in the same video, we need pre-login and post-login pages so that you can test both automated and via clicking around that a, an unauthenticated user can't visit a page that requires authentication and um, that you can still require visit a page that doesn't require it kind of in a public setting without a user. So we need um, to essentially create dummy pages that will um, flesh out later on in the application lifecycle to show that difference. Um, we need to do some kind of tweaks to devise to make it work with turbo. There are some existing solutions out there and we'll, we'll um, kind of choose one of those and uh, implement it in our app. And then these are kind of more situational things. So we'll write a test, user can sign up and confirm account. Um, and then it, it'll fail and then we'll pass the, add the stuff to make it pass. Um, again, some of this device stuff might work out of the box. So in, uh, out of the box plus 
the turbo config. Um, and then you can log in, you can log out. Those are things we need to test. You can reset your password. Um, locking and unlocking works. And then a logged in user can change a password. And that will, I think, get us to a, a viable situation there. The device views will we'll likely customize those at some point during the life of the application. I'm not sure we're going to do it right away in terms of priority, but uh, that is something we'll look forward to. So we'll stop there and pick up in the next video and start actually implementing this epic. Ruby on Rails 7 is out. Code along on a guided journey through the Rails 7 Getting Started Guide and beyond with test-driven development. There has never been a better time to learn Ruby on Rails. Hit the ground running with the newest version. Go to statelesscode.com slash getting started with Rails 7 to level up. Thanks for watching this Stateless Code video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and spread the word. Check out our growing library of videos on our social media channels. Follow us at Stateless Code and Taxation is Theft.